Okay, Terry, hello, good afternoon, guten Tag. And Terry is my only word in Estonian that I can say in the moment. So I apologize for my missing command of Estonian language. The problem is actually that uh, your language is so unrelated to any of my languages that I know. Like, the Roman language is French, Spanish, Portuguese, English, and also to German, that I had a little problem <laughs> getting a, an initial grasp on more than this one word, Terry. Um, my name is Wolfgang Wagner. I am from Austria, from the University of Linz, where I had a professorship on social psychology. I am here for a term for three months to give a seminar and a lecture in the afternoon later. And I'm looking forward to interact with all of you being students of Tartu University. My topic in the seminar is SRT, CSC, and POS. Oh, sorry, uh, let's make it here. Social representation theory, collective symbolic coping, and public understanding of science, which are somehow related because uh, social representation theory can be used to analyze how the public understands and thinks about scientific issues. And collective symbolic coping is a theory that uh, proposes to analyze or to describe a certain part of this process of understanding and the interaction of individual understanding with uh, media processes. And you understand the words public understanding of science, that means how the public copes and understands and transforms uh, science in their everyday uh, thinking. Um, do you have any initial question, maybe? Oh, I should. Oh, I was reminded by Andu that I should say what are the requirements for passing. Uh, we will have this seminar in a form that uh, I will lecture for a certain time, that you will have the opportunity to select a topic and to give a 20 minutes talk about this topic hmm, later in the next month and the next lessons. And uh, those who do not want to talk about a topic or who uh, uh, don't find a topic that fits them would be requested or will be requested to write a short essay. And those who give a presentation will be evaluated and judged by the performance, hmm, by the content and by the format that they choose to present their topic. Those who write an essay will be judged by the quality of their essay. But to be honest, it's easier to make a verbal presentation, OK? Um, and I'm much more lenient when I judge these things. <laughs> because I know how difficult it is as a student to present in the public. Uh, any questions to that? No? I guess about three, four pages. So the essay should be about three to four pages. Is this approximately the requirements that can be accepted, that are accepted? OK. If there are no more questions about this, let's start with the term presentation. And let's ask, what is in a presentation? Well, you all know this famous bridge here in Tartu, the, the bridge for walking uh, over it and for uh, taking a bike ride to the northern part of the city. 
this is obviously a presentation, a representation. In a way, it's a photograph. And it captures, in a certain way, the reality that exists here in Tartu. And uh, I think most of you will be uh, Estonian. Is that true? Is there any non-Estonian here? Several ones. Where are you from? France. From where? France. From France. Oh. Latvia. Latvia. There were some. Who was this? Beg pardon? Czech Republic. Republic. OK. Um, OK, but nevertheless, even the majority of Estonians here will know where Tartu lies in the map of, in the map of Estonia. Uh, of course, it's the red, uh, uh, red mark here. And a map is also a representation. It represents a certain way of looking at the territory, in this case, the territory of Estonia. But the maps have, obviously, a certain content. The content is that it provides knowledge for us about the location of different uh, natural sites of different cities, of villages, in the region of Tartu. It has a structure, because maps are defined by the way of projection of how the territory on the, on the globe, which is, as you all know, uh, uh, curved uh, into a map, into a flat map. It has a function. The function is orientation, to get an orientation on, uh, on the roads, or if you go for a hike when we are hiking, or on a map, it, uh, or on a bicycle, etc., etc. And all these are functions and forms on the individual level. But of course, maps have also social components. And social components are involved, in fact, in order to create maps. We need, we usually share the understanding of the Estonian map, if we are all Estonians, with other Estonians. So we have a social aspect here. We share a certain uh, granul granular knowledge of the territory of Estonia as it is represented in a map. Every Estonian could draw an approximate outline of the, of the territory. Uh, but the map also involves institutions to come about. It needs a mapping institution that has all the relevant data in order to project the image of the Estonian territory onto a flat map. So we have a social component here. And map representations also have a history. We, also, we all know that uh, two or three hundred years ago, the map of Estonia looked a, bit, a little bit different. It was more, uh, compared to the reality, it was more distorted than it is nowadays. And all these things, these components are located on the collective level. So what we see here is that representations, even such simple things as uh, maps, are located more or less on two different levels, on the individual level, our personal knowledge, and on the collective level, if we consider the process of a map coming about. Um, that's uh, that's uh, what I want to, uh, how shall I say, what I want to emphasize here is that any representation, even photographs, do have collective and individual uh, components that are important in order to understand how they came about. But let's now come to a different topic and just enter the the field. Uh, everybody knows and has heard about global warming. Global warming is also named at some times. It's also called uh, the glasshouse effect or the climate change uh, process, etc., etc. What is the history of this idea that we all know nowadays 
and that we all have a representation about or some ideas about. This has a longer history and the, if you look at the history, we can see immediately what a social representation is. Then we can stop and go home. But uh, let's first look at this. About 30 years ago, climate scientists uh, had some findings about the change of climate over the centuries of the last thousand years, for example. They knew or discovered that there was a hot period, a warm period during medieval times and that there was a little ice age the last three or four hundred years that led to problems in food production that led to agricultural uh, difficulties. Thank you. And uh, what we see here is a change in the temperature and the average temperature of the Earth uh, around or across time. When we look today at the scientific uh, production or scientific presentation of this climate change, we always refer to something, or at least the climate scientists refer to something they call a hockey stick. They have analyzed in the meantime, of course, the temperature variations very detailed, in a very detailed way, uh, partly from uh, ice core drills in the Greenland ice or from drills in the Antarctic, etc., etc. And Mann and his crew is one of the leading persons. And he came to, this, uh, to, to the result of this curve, which shows a very steep increase in recent times, which for him is an indicator of a man-made anthropogenic production of carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide gives rise to the glasshouse effect. OK, other scientists looked at the data, corrected the data for certain aspects that Mann did not consider. And there we have a corrected uh, curve, the, the red one. But even this curve shows a steep increase in recent times, which seems to be anthropogenic. And this anthropogenic uh, heating of the Earth's atmosphere and of the oceans is actually something that is threatening, of course. It's not nice to live in a world where most uh, agriculturally productive regions are going to lose their productivity because of desertification, for example. Or we in, in Austria, in Central Europe, we have the problem that the summers are getting hotter and hotter. This summer, for example, in July, and beginning of August, we had temperatures up to 38, which was terrible, uh, really terrible. And you just don't know how to escape. Um, OK, this potential threat, which is also emphasized by the scientists, the climate scientists, uh, triggers something like a societal development. And this societal development has certain steps that are interesting to observe in, uh, in the genesis of a social representation, the representation that we all share today about global warming. So as I said, first there are scientific results which uh, enter into a scientific debate. Hmm? The scientists themselves are debating the very decality of certain aspects of the data. And they also emphasize certain difficult or threatening developments or problems that may arise, arise in the course of climate change and global warming. This threat is taken up by the media, of course. The media are always interested in threats, and they take it up. The non-governmental organizations take it up also, of course. They make it to a cause for themselves, for their own activity. And all this 
goes into public discourse, that's a discourse where people start to worry about their well-being in the future when the global warming is going to increase. They are, of course, afraid of changes in lifestyle, change, uh, afraid of losing out on their present uh, way of life. And if we have this discourse running, of course, politics enters the picture. And politics take up, takes up the issue and starts thinking of what can we do about this. But the problem is, if you just look at, the, at one country, one country and the government of one country cannot do a lot about this because it's a global problem, as, as the concept already says. Therefore, uh, an intergovernmental or international procedure is being, becoming necessary. And one of these intergovernmental procedures was the development or the uh, production of a, of a report, which is a very long report and which is updated every year, by a lot of climate scientists who presented their results and projected, made projections for the future. This was the so-called IPCC, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This was an important step for institutionalizing the issue. And institutions are always part of uh, societal uh, issues because the activities of politics, the creation or the, well, yes, the, 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 the creation of, of international meetings, of Kyoto meeting, for example, or of the Bali meeting, etc., etc., uh, have a certain reflection on the, on the, on the, in the general public, and the general public starts to think, okay, there must be something real in it, and we better get prepared for this. And what the result of all these activities is of the institutionalization in the United Nations, in the format of the IPCC, and the many meetings that were there in, in different places of the world, where politicians discussed the issue, they produce a representation with an ideological character. A representation that takes possession and is distributed knowledge in many, many countries where the majority of people already have a, an idea of what climate change and global warming could be. So, out of this, I mentioned already, came the negotiations and the carbon dioxide, uh, about carbon dioxide reduction or not, if we need to reduce the emissions of cars, the emissions of uh, factories in order to cope with the problem, or is it enough to develop some technological uh, tools in order to reduce global warming, etc., etc. All these different opportunities or possibilities were discussed in these different meetings. The problem was, and basically as everybody knows, that the United States and China actually opted out and didn't really want to uh, participate in these uh, endeavors, trying to curb or to stop the carbon dioxide emissions. And it was a problem because both countries are the biggest emitters of carbon dioxide and the biggest contributors to the global problem. Anyway, all these negotiations, etc., resulted in a uh, public representation that people share in many countries and that if you make interviews with people more or less it's going to be reduced to a hockey, hockey stick where the people have the imagination okay it's enough to see the the steep rise 
of carbon dioxide emissions and temperatures in recent times in order to have a proof for anthropogenic production of the global change, of the global climate change. And of course, in a more, in a more uh, everyday way, they represent themselves to be sweating and being in a hot climate in 20 or 30 years, like here in the sauna. So, this is a very global, very big and quick, let's say quick and dirty uh, presentation of what social representations are. And I want to, I want to uh, alert you to the different components, the components of uh, social representations that exist in our heads that can be assessed on an individual way, on an individual level, and on the components that are necessary on the collective level, like institutionalization, like having polit politics involved, like having the media involved, and also, of course, the, the non-governmental organization. OK. Um, I want to make a little experiment with you now. Do we have uh, to write here? Yes, here. OK. I will show you a series of sentences about something that's happening. And I ask you to just sit back, relax, and observe what is going to be shown. And then I will ask you a few questions about it. OK, you ready? You don't need to write. You just should look at the project. So, uh, okay. So, my question is now which sentences were projected? Was this sentence projected? Oh, sorry. Was it projected? Yes or no? Uh, can you raise your hand if you say yes? So I get an impression of the quantity of people. So it's uh, one third, shall I say? OK. What about this? Did this occur? It's a little bit more people. OK. What about this? A few. OK. Quota. What about this? Oh, quite a lot, actually. What about this? Also a lot. What about this? OK, I didn't make the statistics in detail now. What about this the last, last item? Only a few. OK. Um, why was this? Why did some people hesitate to, to say yes, this appeared, or this did not? You were not sure, weren't you? Memory problems. Memory problems. <laughs> that was just one minute of presentation. What shall I expect after one and a half hours of talking? <laughs> Oh, God. I think it's more about the sentence, so it's mostly about the details. And because we, whether the jazz stood on the, kitchen, on the table or in the kitchen, and we kind of pay attention to the general idea and not so much the exact details. Yeah. Because you're not sure yeah. whether yeah. the details okay. is there or not. True. Yeah. Catch the meaning. yeah. They could well be all wrong, actually. <laughs> none of them was actually written there. Well, let's look at the. <laughs> There was this sentence, the ants ate the sweet jam, but none of the others. <laughs> Four, which actually captures the whole action in the kitchen, was not there, but many recognized it as having been there. And the reason for this is, of course, the construction of a schema. 
a cognitive schema that you that is important for you and not the details that are there. You imagine or read about the kitchen, uh, a table, jam, etc., etc., and the ants that are everywhere in the kitchen, and you have an image of the or a memory of the whole thing and not of the details. And this is exactly something where you uh, transcend your individual uh, perception of stimuli. But you generalize beyond the stimuli that you see and construct something actively in your mind, in your cognitive, uh, in your cognitive uh, apparatus that for you is a representation of what has been presented. And very similar, only in, in a longer time, let's say, in a, in, in, a, in a longer time extension, can we uh, take this as a model for the coming about of social representations, uh, which is also more or less the construction of a schema in in the case of the social representation, a schema that is much more complex about an issue like, for example, global warming that uh, we all share about to a higher or lesser degree. So if we conclude out of what we have been talking uh, now is that models or the schemata that come out from abstracting from single stimuli come about and construct uh, a cognitive whole. They construct a model of what has been presented. And this, of course, refers to our pre-existing knowledge, the pre-existing knowledge that we have of jam being sweet, of knowing of uh, that many times the wasps and the ants want to eat our jam bread, our marmalade bread, etc., etc. So it exists, it refers to existing knowledge, and existing knowledge is a very helpful, uh, a very helpful issue in order to understand what is going on. We have an active construal process where cognitive elements or scripts, schema or scripts are being constructed. And in the case of social representations, when we talk, just as we talked about the little experiment here, where you have a constructive commu communicative process that gives rise to, uh, to the representations that we all keep in our heads on the individual level by processes on the collective level. Because, of course, in the case of uh, societal issues like global warming, there are always the media, mass media also involved, and they often communicate uh, with the help of images and metaphors of photographs, etc. And these photographs and images have a very important uh, role, play a very important role in our understanding processes. And out of this come what we call a social representation. So if we conclude, what is not a social representation? A social representation is not a set of attitudes. Attitudes, what are attitudes? Attitudes are, you all know what attitudes are. What is an attitude? Can you tell me? Okay, close, but not quite. <laughs> Who wants to tell me what an attitude is? Based on values. Where are we? Are you talking? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Based, yes, values, and it is a positive or negative judgment about something. No? I can have an attitude towards a door, a closed door. I don't like closed doors, or I like closed doors, etc. I can have an attitude to certain individuals here. This is a useful concept in uh, psychology, in, 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 in 
social psychology, but it is not enough to describe what a social representation is. So it is not a set of attitudes. It's also not a set of beliefs or opinions. That's not enough to form a social representation. Social representations always involve images. Just remember the image that I conveyed or used to illustrate global warming. The global warming image of the hockey stick and maybe of a sauna is uh, an image that helps to capture for us the most important essence of a, an issue. But that's, of course, not enough to describe or characterize a social representation. Um, OK, it is not only a popular lay theory, because together with our knowledge about global warming, we also maintain a theory of about how does it come about, for example, by the fact that we are using uh, oil, natural oil and gas, and all this natural oil and gas has been accumulated during hundreds of millions of years, and we burn it within a few hundred years. Now, that certainly must have some effect on, on the surroundings and on nature. And it is not only about objects, but about what we call facts. An object becomes a fact only when it is being represented in a social or collective way. If we turn around the question, what is a social representation? We can say that at the beginning of a social representation of uh, global warming, for example, we have a process of collective symbolic hoping that we will talk about later. Uh, social representations are a form of everyday knowledge, something that we can use to talk to others, where we will be understood easily. Uh, and uh, which is a knowledge that is important for communication, that enables communication in a way. And it is or can be expressed on, in a multitude of ways and on many different levels. It can be expressed by talking about it. It can be named usually the issues that we represent. I want to make sure that my telephone is not ringing. Sorry. Because I heard a sound probably from you, but just to be sure. It can be expressed verbally and on the collective level in the form of a discourse going ahead. It can be expressed in behavior, in action. Not necessarily, not only by talking about something, but in behavior. And Therefore, it will become visible in interaction patterns and communication patterns. Once a social representation becomes a very important issue, it is being, uh, uh, going to be represented in documents, of course, and in institutions. <coughs> documents and institutions are the, if we want to say, reified versions of social representations. Um, and at the end, if we wrap all this up more or less, social representation theory is a social psychological approach to analyze societal phenomena. Uh, it's not so much a strict theory that allows us to make <coughs> sharp hypotheses that we can test experimentally. It's more something like a, like a uh, an approach to certain problems, something that you have in your head and uh, in order to uh, collect your ideas about a societal problem of how and of how to analyze this. Um, 
Yeah, the theory of social representation comes from uh, Serge Moscovici, and he used a term that is very similar to what Emile Durkheim uh, presented 100 years earlier in the 19th <coughs> century. He talked in his uh, famous book on representations about individual representations that were for him more or less neurological processes in the brain. Even though Durkheim didn't know very much about neural, uh, neurological processes themselves in their detail, but he said that what he understands as the individual representational process, what we do cognitively, for example, is a neurological or brain defined process. And he, besides the individual representations, he talked about collective representations. And these collective representations are those that define a culture. For example, religion. He wrote his famous book about suicide and said that suicide is a certain expression of cultures that in different countries have different uh, forms, take different forms. And of course, any other culturally relevant object. So what's important with the collective representations is that they are culturally anchored, that they are very permanent things, like religion is, as we all know, is a permanent thing, not easy to be uh, changed in a society. We see this particularly acute way by the recent migration wave in southern and central Europe, where all these people not only carry their body and their individual lives with them, but as a relative problem for Europe, but also a certain kind of religion, Islam in this case, that has some incompatibility with Western uh, ways of thinking. So religion is a very stable thing. And this for Emile Durkheim was part of the collective representation system. So on comes Serge Moscovici in the 1950s, in the 20th century, and suggested that in modern societies, with their highly developed system of mass media, we will, uh, it doesn't make much sense only to talk about Durkheimian collective representation that are deeply anchored in culture. But we have to take care of representational processes where the media play an important role. The media play an important role in developing and fostering and uh, promoting ideas that come about in the modern world, and that may change rather quickly, again, like a fashion, for example. So social representations is a perspective that is much more dynamic than the older sociological way of talking, uh, like Durkheim. So social representations is something that takes care of, for example, of scientific insights that become popularized and, and, and well-known in certain societies. It takes care of, actually, of any issue that, is, that becomes societally relevant. Relevance is an important word in this, uh, in this uh, realm. So in a way, we can say that collective representations a la Durkheim and the social representations a la Moscovici built more or less two poles on a continuum of very stable ideas that exist in a culture and are very difficult to shed, and social representations that are much more uh, in flux, much more changeable. And they're spanning more or less cultures versus societies. Uh, When something new 
enters our or society's life, usually people are surprised. Ah, what is this? Why are scientists or astronomers, at least those parts of a society that have a little bit of, of scientific interest, uh, may wonder what, what is this? What are astronomers talking about when they talk about black holes? Uh, when scientists talk about, or astronomers talk about black holes and a certain section of the public um, hears about it and gets interested in it, the first action they will do is trying to anchor this new concept in their pre-existing sphere of knowledge. This anchoring is a basic process that we can observe in social representation processes. It means more or less to refer to what I already know in order to understand the new. It means categorizing the novel in terms of the old, uh, of the old images and metaphors that are accessible to me and that are accessible to my experience. And this has consequences that I will explain later because the projection or the uptake of already known ideas in order to understand the novel uh, has uh, unintended consequences also that we can observe or that we have analyzed in studies. So anchoring is more or less at the first step, a first step of coping with a new thing, with a new development. Uh, it's quite important because new developments, so let's put aside the idea of a black hole, but there are more important things like, as I said, global warming, for example, or the introduction of technologies that uh, have an impact on our daily life, like, for example, uh, biotechnology genetic engineering. This was a huge, uh, a huge issue that created a lot of discourse all over Europe, not only Europe, but all around the world, in order to, in order to, for the public to understand it, to come to terms with it, and to judge whether this is going to damage my very existence, my children, or my life, my, my, my health, or not. And this is an issue that I want to talk in detail later because we did studies on these things. So in doing this uh, anchoring process, in referring to the well-known pre-existing knowledge that everybody of us has, we unintentionally transfer attributes that are not very useful with the novel. The second basic process can be called objectification. Once the media and once politics, for example, or NGOs, non-governmental organizations, take up the issue, this evolving discourse has consequences for the ontological status of a new Thing. For example, when, uh, well, we all have this is a piece of paper, of course. And actually, what do you do with a piece of paper? You throw it away or you put it there. But the very fact that there are some numbers on it and that it is being valued in a society makes it a valuable piece of paper. And this is a prime example of an objectified idea. An idea that became a reified such that everybody knows how to deal with this and rarely mistakes this piece of paper as a piece of paper. We don't treat it as a piece of paper, we treat it as something different. Uh, so objectification is a reification of what we imagine to be the case. For example, of uh, the idea 
uh, imagining the idea that a piece of paper has a certain value. That's an idea, just, I don't know. It's on good uh, belief. We believe that it has a value, and in this belief, we exchange the money in a society. So in a way, the abstract ideas of value become a concrete, get a concrete character. They were nearly touchable. We can touch this value, more or less, uh, with our fingers. And it becomes independent of us. It becomes objective, in a way. And later, the more discourse is about an issue, in modern societies, the more the media talk about it and the more the media use pictures to illustrate a new thing, the more the issue becomes immunized against questioning. It becomes objective, existing, and starts to populate our world without, that we, without us asking how do we come to consider a piece of paper as value. And the objectification process has a consequence for our behavior. Of course, as I just showed with the piece of paper, and it's a little bit similar for those sociologists here who heard about Garfinkel and Schütz, for example, becomes something like a natural attitude. It's we are, we would be surprised if an objectified issue suddenly uh, doesn't react or does not evoke the reaction that we expected. Okay? So in a way, anchoring is the first step of trying to understand a new issue. It's about using your pre-existing knowledge and objectification is what comes out of the social interaction, of the discourse, of the, of the dealing of the media, etc., etc. What is this? It's a formula for accreditation. It's a formula? OK. That's all you see? I see a bird as well. You see a bird as well? OK. It's a dove in a blue sky. You see something red? What is this? A bomb? Yes? No, come on. <laughs> Please, tell me what it is. It's a mural in, uh, that I, by coincidence, took a picture of in, in Brazil. So it's a painting on a wall. But what does it mean? I mean... War and peace. War and peace. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, this thing exemplifies war and peace and probably because the dove is white and of course symbolizes something valuable uh, it's a political argument in favor of peace and not of war but the formula that was that you mentioned at the beginning is there still is there what is this formula? Some will know. Well, gravity, not really. For gravity, it would need a G, the gravity constant, but it's not that. It has to do with relativity theory, but what? He, uh, okay, I notice we are not in the physics class, but but still, it's, it's every day, I, I thought always, it's every day knowledge to see that this is Einstein's formula of how energy relates to mass. So energy equals the mass times, what is C? Speed of light, Speed of light to the square. Speed of light to the square, of course, is a big, 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 big number. And anything multiplied with that, a little mass, for example, one gram, becomes a high, huge, and terrible form and quantity of energy, as we all know from bombs. Uh, that's a close-up. But the funny thing is, what is, 
why do people in a little city of Brazil use the, such a formula? I must admit it was the picture was taken about 15 years ago, but still so of obviously with a political message. The political message is, we already said, uh, preserve peace, symbolized by the dove, and the bomb beneath is the atomic bomb or the hydrogen bomb that is uh, used to illustrate the destructive forces of war. And this physic, uh, physical formula that's part of relativity theory, actually, of Einstein's theory, became objectified as a political symbol. A political symbol that can be used in everyday communication. And I, 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 I'm convinced that the big majority of Brazilians passing by have no idea what E equal MC square means. They just capture the picture of E equal MC square in order to understand that this has something to do with atomic bombs. And uh, that's a kind of objectification of a physics formula that has been used in a political campaign here. Also a process of objectification. We already used an example that was money and the use of money, the fact of university is a social representation that has a lot of institutional aspects. And it has behavioral aspects because you're so nice students, you're all doing what you should be doing. You're not lying on the banks. You're not sleeping. You're not dancing. Although it would be fun to do, actually. But you're sitting here and listening. So your behavior reflects a certain understanding of the concept of university, and my behavior reflects the way or the task of teaching that I'm doing. So such institutions contain a, a, a big lot of individual knowledge of what a university can be and does, and of the behavior that is appropriate in such a place. I mentioned biotechnology that was a new technology in uh, about 15 years ago and that created a lot of discourse and debate and uh, fears in Europe, in many countries, and I will discuss it later in more detail. Uh, the effect of conception, of getting a child is a deeply seated representation that I will try to shatter with you. The concept of a child, of course, every sociologist knows that a child is a very historically relative concept. A child was a different thing in the 19th century than it was in the 20th century. Otherwise, we could not understand how in uh, British or UK mining they could use little kids of the age of six, seven or eight years to go into the mines and do the, the mining because they were small, they could, could, could enter into smaller holes than adults could. But this presupposed a different understanding of what a child is. For them it was a small adult, for us nowadays it's a very uh, it's an, an object or a being that affords our help, our understanding, our, our protection. No? So presently we already mentioned climate change and global warming, fracking, etc. are becoming something that are societally relevant and that are going to enter a to enter the societal discourse in order to be objectified into some idea that we will 
be able to analyze or discover, let's say, in a few years' time. So let's look at the process scheme in order to illustrate the whole thing. First, we have a group. The group has, in this case, three different objects inside, meaning the concepts that the group uses to describe their everyday uh, world. So a group has, in this case, three objects that are being ideas that are being objectified that they use to regulate their life. So suddenly, something new comes up. A rupture occurs in the daily life, in the fabric of daily uh, life. And something uh, sets on that we call the media, uh, the media attention or the media setting an agenda. Something new comes up, the media capture it because they always in, are in search of something new, something shocking or whatever. And they do it at the beginning, of course, uh, by using anchoring processes. That's what we called anchoring before. Out of this first media agenda setting, which is a term used in media communication theory, comes a collective discourse that goes around and round and round and round. Many media report every day and over weeks, and people discuss these things, and sometimes politics enters the whole, uh, the whole discourse. And at the end, this process coalesces, more or less, and objectifies the issue that is, or the ideas that have been discussed into a new social representation. And by doing this, the new social representation becomes a new object that is being added to the social world of the group. So the uh, whole process that we see on the right side of the picture, the threat that appears to the uh, individuals composing the group, the members of the group, are posing a threat. Something new ruptures the familiar web of life, of everyday life in this group. This makes it necessary trying to understand the thing, to cope with it, uh, by using processes of anchoring, which are later elaborated in this course using the media. And all this develops at the end into an objectification that is widely shared, that everybody understands, and that uh, creates a new object that is being described by a new social a representation. I already said, or let's say, it's implied by what I've said until now, that social representations, of course, have very little to do with veridical knowledge about biotechnology, for example. They are not true with uh, quotation marks, not true representations of a, a new scientific insight, for example, or of, of the economic value of money. We don't need to understand economics to know of how to behave with, with the, the piece of uh, paper money. You know? And this has, uh, this is not needed. We don't need a scientifically or veridically uh, correct representation in order to act as is required by a new thing. But uh, the image must be good to communicate, it must be good to think about, it must be usable in everyday life. Okay? For example, the idea of, of climate uh, change is a very complex climate climatological problem and has many, many, many aspects that occupies many different scientific specialists 
and experts in the field. But in order to talk about it, to understand newspaper reporting or TV shows about this topic, we don't need a veridical representation of all this climatological, physical, geophysical background. It's enough to have a global understanding of a hockey stick, for example, and what it means to our daily life, that it becomes warmer in order to do this. And a very, very nice example of this uh, process is a study by Bangad and Heath that I want to present. It shows the role of collective necessities, that it's not, that it's very important to consider in sociological studies, to consider not the individual necessities, individual desires, but the collective necessities of states in this case. Uh, the study was about the Mozart effect. Has anybody heard about the Mozart effect? It has, have you heard because you are running, uh, laughing? Have you heard about it? Not about, Not about this. Uh, it was the result of a scientific psychological study in the US some time ago where they discovered in their study with psychology students, undergrads, that they solved an intelligence test better when at the same time classical music, in this case Mozart music, was being played. So they had higher scores in a, in a in space, spatial intelligence uh, tests, items, that uh, seem to indicate that classical mood music involves or, or, or enhances the functioning of cognitive processes that helps the students to achieve higher uh, spatial intelligence scores. Nowadays, it, the, the effect doesn't exist anymore because uh, repetitions or rec uh, other studies have shown that this is not doesn't seem to be true. But what we can show with this is the evolution of a scientific legend. Scientific legend that had really uh, talkable, palpable consequences. Let's first look at the intensity of media reporting. Whenever we make a study about societal issues, it's always good to have a look at media. What and how much do the media report talk about an issue. Here we see that at the beginning, uh, the first study, there was um, average, a very relatively low interest in the media. Then the findings were repeated in a certain, uh, by certain laboratories and with some lag, some time after some time, the media took up the idea because obviously several laboratories reported similar results. Even nowadays it's uh, shown that it doesn't, uh, that it's not a, a very reliable effect. So in a way, always triggered by certain scientific publications, the media start to report a lot. And this media interest does not come by coincidence. It comes by systematic motivation and is controlled by collective needs. These colleagues looked at the 50 different states of the US and they took the pupil test scores of these different states, which were different in the states, the average pupil test uh, school. I don't know what is the, the, the national test scores that you uh, assess in the states uh, every year. Does anybody know? I forgot the name of this. Anyway, this has a name. In the US, uh, pupils or students are always tested every year and you have a record, a very reliable record of the average 
cognitive intelligence of students and pupils in the 50 different US states. Then they took the gross domestic product of these states uh, and took the states as a as independent uh, as, as cases in a study in a regression analysis where the independent variables were the our the, the, the teacher salaries, forgot to mention this. They also assessed average teacher salaries in different states to see whether the government of these states puts uh, some importance on education or not. And they disc there were differences, of course, because the teacher salaries are not regulated nationwide in the US. And they entered the teacher salary and the national test scores into a, a regression analysis. And the reporting, the quantity of reporting of the local media as the dependent verb in the regression. And what they found was that low teacher salary resulted in a very impressive beta score of 0.61, which is the partial correlation of a low teacher salary uh, item or variable with the dependent variable of reporting in this particular state. But also the 0.41 score of the, of the test scores of the pupils is a high score, a high beta. 0.41 being the partial correlation of the test scores of the pupils for explains the square of 0.41 is 16% of the quantity of mass media attention in a particular state. So what this data show is that in states where the school system had a problem because either the teacher salaries were low and the government, the local government did not put a lot of interest in, the, in, in teaching and school education, resulted uh, in lower test scores, of course, because the teaching was not of high quality. And all this resulted in higher reporting of the local media about the Mozart effect. Strange, no? Because the Mozart effect appeared as a simple solution to the education problem. <laughs> Just play a baby, a symphony of Mozart, and he or she, the baby, will become more intelligent. A very simple solution. So the local media attention correlates strongly with the collective problems in a state. The more pressing the problem, the more the fact that a simple CD of Mozart or classical music uh, is thought to promote uh, intelligence of young kids, meaning that during the range of time that, uh, in this case, 1994 to 2002, uh, the colleagues also studied the change of the addressee of who the media thought can be influenced by classical music. And first, of course, it was college students, and this is the high score at the left, the black one. That's the real uh, population, the real sample that the psychologists used to, to uh, study this effect. But this veridical element became less and less important, dropped in the reporting, and people more or less, more and more projected the same effect onto other samples, onto other populations 
like babies, like children. Because, of course, uh, it's difficult to bring college students to listen to Mozart, usually, because that's not the time, the trend of the time. They prefer to listen to heavy metal or other uh, music that can be described as pop music. But you could influence kids and babies when you give them some uh, concert in the cradle in order to make them more intelligent. Uh, you may. Uh, it was classical classical music, so 200 years old, uh, and defined as typically Mozart style. Not so much Bach, not so much the later, the later modernists like Schoenberg, Berg, etc. But it was the classical pre-romantic, romantic style of making classical music. This was used with, uh, there were different musics used in these different studies, okay, in order to assess this effect. You can't just assume a causal relationship between uh, media reportings and uh, reportings on uh, the Mozart uh, thing. I mean, could be a third factor responsible. Right? For example? For example, uh, interest in classical music. How do you mean? That the st uh, college students who were in the test, the subjects? Yeah. That they were? No, more that uh, you are linking uh, the fact that uh, the media reports more often on the journal, right? On the study. Uh, the media talk about the Mozart effect more frequently and significantly more frequently in countries where they have a schooling problem. Uh, yeah, there that's could be other things responsible for the fact that they're reporting more often, apart from the schooling problem. Right? Uh, yeah, of course, there may be, of course, as you say, there may be cultural differences between different states yeah. in the US. Uh, but it would be, I mean, there is probably a big cultural difference between the East Coast, the Central area, and the West Coast. They have different cultures of, of how to, of music, of course, of uh, how to pass leisure time and things like that. But uh, in fact, I think this would be hard to, had to check out because uh, well, let me think through it. I mean, the, the biggest problems we can expect from here, from a very not very well informed position, could be in the middle Midwest, which are very agricultural states that probably have not a big interest in, in, in promoting or in developing a good school system. Could be true, cultural difference, true. Whereas in the East Coast and West Coast, this is more developed. And probably this is so, though this should be investigated, of course, could be. But there is a political proof to my hypothesis, now to the hypothesis of the colleagues that was Oh, let me first finish this projection here. So it became children and babies instead of college students in the reporting, and which means that the representations that developed in the general public, that Mozart music could help our kids to become top performers, uh, took hold. In the, in the way that it was the kids and the babies and not the students that could be targeted by this, by this educational means, okay? But the political proof is that even the politicians believed it and one governor 
particularly of Georgia, a US state gave a classical CD to all new mothers, believing that he can raise the intelligent quotient of his state. And I think that's a little bit ridiculous. Okay. So, what this study by Bangader and Heath shows is actually the role of the intensity of media reporting that drives the social representative process. We must be careful when we use the term representation. The first idea is, when we think of representation, the first idea is to think about an object that represents another object. Okay? Uh, or, for example, our ideas about another object can be a representation of this other object. So, the product of our attainment of knowledge could be called a representation. That is true, and that's a perfectly valid use of the term. But the word representation also has another meaning if we don't use it in the plural. If we don't say representations, but representation, we can characterize the process of attaining the knowledge, the background knowledge, the shared knowledge that we all have about an issue. And this second understanding is for some people a little bit difficult to, to accept. And uh, even in scientific studies, one notices that fall back into the stable, not process-oriented idea of what a social representation is. That's uh, why we sometimes use the term representing when we want to point to the process, instead of representation as a noun. Uh, that usually is misunderstood as only the product of a representation process. Okay. Um, let's summarize. The novel, the rupture that uh, exists or comes about in a society or in a group gives or initiates, triggers a media reporting process, the media agenda setting, the discourse and the political ramifications that we can, uh, that we can observe, uh, the anchoring processes and at the end the uh, objectification processes in the behavior of the people in order to create a, an understanding of a new phenomenon. And this new phenomenon is at the end a new social representation that becomes part of everyday life of the coping group. And with this I want to say for now, uh, thank you. But I want to, if there are no questions or discussion interests from your side on this topic, everything clear? Not yet, we will go on with these things, okay? But what I want to talk about is potential themes for your presentations. As I said, working out a verbal oral presentation here is uh, easier and definitely much more fun than writing an essay. So I suggest the following topics that I have written here. Let me see. Okay. Okay. 
in PUS, in public understanding of science. Uh, I've prepared some studies that have been done. Uh, and I have a lot of examples from the recent problem of climate change that has been discussed or analyzed the last five or six years very intensely in social sciences. So one topic could be climate change and global warming. Looking at this from different perspectives, from everyday people's perspective, how they think about global warming on the aspect of media reporting, media images that are being transported, metaphors, images, on uh, political responses and the political debate going on about climate change, which is a very interesting thing. Then another topic is biotechnology, where we have done some work. I mean, that's not a, an extremely hot topic nowadays, but it was a hot topic uh, when it came up in Europe. Uh, in the meantime, countries, different countries have regulated the use of genetic, uh, genetically engineered organisms, GMOs, in their local legislation. And some countries forbid GMOs uh, in agriculture completely, others uh, are more lenient on this. There is a new development that's not yet really strongly entered the public discourse, that's syn synthetic biology. That's where scientists, biologists and geneticists try to construct from scratch the genome of a new, new being, new animal, new bacteria, let's say. Uh, we have some studies on that. There is biology and medicine, where we have studies that are also quite interesting to talk about. And my interest would be to know who are people who would be interested in climate change and global warming, to talk a little bit, can accommodate. Um, Four or five, four or five talking talks about it. Okay, hello, wake up. Is it that you don't like to talk, or is it that you don't like the topic? Maybe. Maybe. Sorry. There can be there can be other topics also, but I would need to search first if we find. But when we well, we should agree once we have distributed the things. If it's in two weeks, three weeks, uh, four weeks, we all meet every two weeks, no? So uh, I could still do a lecture next time. So the first presentations would be in one month, which is a lot of time, I must say. But what are the requirements? The requirements is to, to look at the paper that I give you, according to your interests. And you check the paper, you read it, try to understand it, and present it in 15 to 20 minutes. I see. Orally. I see. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Was there a misunderstanding? Ah, okay. Okay, I was I was unclear. I give I give papers to you, of course. Yes, I. I help you find find sources. Um, can we have? Uh, can somebody give me a sheet of paper, please? Maybe one of yours. Okay, thank you. Who is? I ask first about climate change because I have the, the high quantity of, of papers on that. Okay, can everybody of you write the name? Can you write the heading climate change? And under this heading you write your name? Before making the choices regarding the essays, will the essays also have a specified topics or there were... But topics. 
Yes. But, but let me say one thing. Um, as we have three months to go for the last, for the last uh, day of the seminar, where I want you to receive your things, or let's say, where we can discuss the, the essays. Uh, I am not going to distribute today the topics for the essay. But still, we will have to choose from the topics you offer, not just go find something. Well, we, if you don't take one of those topics, we shall discuss. And oh, okay. I, if I accept it, it's fine. If not, OK? It depends on the quantity and quality of literature that I can produce to this. OK? OK, uh, now we have the climate change people. Can other people make up their mind for biotech and genetic engineering? One person, second person. And in one sweep, I mean synthetic biology is another one. <laughs> That's closely related, but where I don't have too many papers. So only two, let's say. So who was climate change still? And okay, you are biotech or climate change? Okay, write your name and you start a new column maybe underneath with the heading biotech, right. Do we have an idea of a topic of, of, a, of a, an issue that we can, that comes to your mind? Uh, you mean something well, from that social we can. sciences? Well, from social sciences, I don't know too much. Maybe psychological essentialism? Well, that's not a representation. That's a completely different thing, I would say. OK, where is the paper? Here, okay. Uh, maybe, no. Let's let's do it. We we are not in a big hurry. Anybody interested in biology, medicine stuff? We have not too many things on that. Primarily, what uh, we have is a paper by Bangerter on on uh, how people in an experiment generalize and make scientific information simpler, simplification of scientific information. And another study by us on how the sperm dominates the ovum. Hmm? Scientific, social scientific interpretation of the process of conception. Um, so I can actually deal with two people. Can we just the paper? If you can think of one, we should coordinate this. OK? Where is the sheet of paper for which topic? Ah, OK. Well, this can accommodate more. History would be interesting. Yes, uh, sure. Do you know studies? Huh? Okay, uh, Andrew just suggested that history might be an interesting topic, of course, being relevant for Estonian uh, Estonian politics. Excuse me, just a question for me. When you're listening like this, do I speak too low? Shall I speak up? Okay. I just need some feedback of how I'm intelligible in the back, OK? Oh, you're fine. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> so history is a good, yeah, that's a good thing. Perfect. Thank you.
for history. I need to check. I haven't checked this topic yet. But uh, I, we can stay in contact by the website, by the teaching website here, where I can load up uh, relevant things. OK. Um, so I ask you to check out the teaching website. How do you call it? Moodle, the Moodle thing. But not before the end of next week, because for four days I'm out of town to do to a conference. OK, so end of next week. So you will post the papers? I will post papers, PDFs. I will post the whole PDF. The whole paper, the PDF. You can download the paper. OK? OK, that, no, sorry, excuse me. Can you just for one second remain silent because the I colleague wants to say something? Quite clear in the whole process. You will post papers, right. papers, say 10 biotech papers. For example. And I pulled down any of those that I liked, which means that several people could be. Well, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, will you assign us a paper? Which I will. Yes, OK, good. But uh, you're quite right, actually. Yes, I mean, 